Um, so this panel is a little bit different than the morning panel that had a lot of um, presentations and in-depth look um, at different public uses, awareness of earthquake early warning. This panel is the industry panel, and we have a very nice range of panelists here that are going to be more talking about ideas and engaging with questions. So I hope you're really ready. I know it's like the end of the conference, and you probably just want to sit back in your chair and not have anybody notice you, but I am going to call on you, and you're going to have to answer questions, so be ready. Um, so we're, I'm going to introduce all four of our panelists, and then we're just going to basically go down the line. They're going to give you a little update on what they're working on, what their ideas are, what their vision for the future of implementation for earthquake early warning. And then I have a couple questions to answer, ask the panelists, and then we're going to open it up. Because um, this being the last session, if you've had any lingering things that you really want to say, comments that you wanted to share, um, or just lingering questions that you want to get out, um, this would be the opportunity to do so. So first, sitting directly to my left, is Josh Basham. Um, he's from Early Warning Labs, and they are working on commercializing earthquake early warning for the general public. Um, we also have John McPartland, who is the director of District 5 Bay Area, Bay Area Rapid Transit. Um, he also has a background in emergency management, and he's one of the beta, well, his group is one of the beta testers of the Shake Alert system. Then we have Aviv Siegel, who is the chief technology officer for Ad Hoc. Um, Ad Hoc is a network centric interactive crisis communication group, and they are also beta testers of the Shake Alert system. And finally, we have Shunta Noda, who um, was working on the Shinkansen with the Railway Tech Research Institute in Japan, and he's now currently a visiting scientist with the USGS. So, welcome, panelists, and I'm just going to, if you could grab this microphone, we'll just go down the row. Um, and Make sure it's on, everyone yeah, can hear me well, started. okay. So again, I'm Josh Basham with uh, Early Warning Labs. Uh, we're located in Santa Monica, Silicon Beach, as we like to call it. Um, our main goal is to collaborate with uh, both the USGS, Caltech, Berkeley, and help deliver low-cost uh, alerts along with automated response based off of those alerts. So one of the main ways we do that is leveraging technology. So we're, we have, we have some R&D that's going on, and we're looking at moving a lot of these calculations into the cloud, and along with delivering these alerts through the cloud directly to the individual users. And one way we've done that is we've developed an iOS app. Um, and it's, it's, it's nothing that's released to the public. It's strictly just for, for research and testing. Uh, but we've successfully been able to take what, what used to run on what you've seen is uh, uh, shake alert, the user display. We've taken uh, those calculations that run on a machine in an office or um, or in the research research areas. We've actually taken that, we've made those calculations in the cloud so we can push out those notifications to individual users based off of their GPS location. They can also select on the app, they can select um, their physical location or alert area. Um, we also are working with some of the other beta testers of shake alert to do automated response. So we're working with one of the large uh, film studios and theme parks in uh, Los Angeles that um, want us to come in and, and start experimenting with certain actions we can take. So some of the things we're testing are um, opening fire station doors, uh, playing an alert to the, the fire personnel to pull out the rigs before the shaking starts at their location, which is sort of standard, you know, standard procedure now, but what they do is they wait until they feel the shaking, and then they pull the trucks out, and with a big earthquake, that could possibly be too late, and the trucks get stuck inside. So uh, we're also uh, working on delivering these alerts through uh, their existing radio system, which is a Motorola uh, digital system. And we have the ability to tap into their radio system through the equipment that we've developed and uh, deliver those alerts to the security personnel and the, the decision makers on site. So uh, some really fun, fun developments and, and some interesting research that we're doing and uh, obviously sharing that back with the, the community and finding out kind of what end users want to do and what we can and, and can't do. So we're really excited to be a part of this and uh, I'll pass it down. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you, John McPartland. For those who are not from uh, the Bay Area, uh, I'm a director for the Bay Area Rapid Transit, which is the rail system that moves approximately well, uh, north of 400,000 people per day on, on weekdays throughout the entire Bay Area with up to 65 trains running uh, at peak commutes both in the morning and in the evening. Some of those trains end up having 10 cars. And in comparison, the derailment that they had in New York City in December of last year only had 100 people on that train, of which 60 people were injured, four died, um, and they ended up uh, with a, a derailment that they had. Uh, in the event of a major earthquake, the early warning system that we implemented in uh, uh, 2012, we now have uh, in a position, we are now in the position to get that warning, initiate the slowdown of the trains so that we can end up preventing the derailments. By the way, as a follow-up to this, uh, BART is in wrapping up on a $1 billion investment on retrofitting the entire system so that it will both uh, survive and portions of it, greater portions of it will be operational in the immediate post-earthquake uh, era or time frame, whether it be the 24, 72, 48, or 10 days uh, that may end up uh, following when the complete this is for you know the emergency managers here when the complete infrastructure has collapsed and we have basically uh, no way to get evacuees out or equipment in and the the hope is that if we can end up preventing the derailments we'll be able to facilitate that uh, emergency management process and as well as prevent the types of injuries just think about it from the standpoint of a 10-car train that BART has on um, each one of those cars during that peak commute will have 100 people in it. So that's 10 times that, as far as the potential is concerned. And we have 65 of those trains running. Even if there are no critical injuries associated with that, where are the public safety uh, responders going to come from in an immediate post-earthquake time frame when all of those public safety people are exhausted? Uh, all those resources are gone. So uh, it's uh, sort of like a, a, a threefer uh, in that case. Uh, you don't put the load on the, the public safety. You prevent the injuries as well as sustain the system. All right. And we go ahead and we test that quarterly. And um, uh, if we, the, the premise that we have, what can you do in 10 seconds? Well, in 10 seconds, I can take a train and I can reduce that from 30 miles an hour and bring it to a complete stop or take a 70 mile an hour and redu reduce it down to 40 miles an hour. That is huge. All right, and that's our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Aviv Siegel and I'm the Chief Technical Officer for ETHOC. Actually, Efraim Patel was speaking, uh, he's my colleague and was speaking here yesterday. Um, and uh, what I wanted to share is a little bit about what ETHOC has been doing and some of our um, takeaways and lessons learned from probably more than 10 years that we are dealing with crisis communication and certainly with early warning systems in um, very large organizations and states and countries. Um, one thing to, that, that I want to stress, as, actually as an industry, is that um, this effort is not an industry effort, it's a partnership. And this is something that we see time and again. Um, without the partnership, actually, there's not much the industry can do. We can develop the best technology in the world, but you know what? If there's no partnership, and the partnership here is, here is between the government, between the community, and between the industry. And these three pillars have to be um, working together in order to make things happen. And uh, even the last uh, panel presentation, Mark Lucero was speaking about what the government is doing and how regulation um, help, quote-unquote, the carriers um, to comply um, with, uh, with certain uh, prerequisites in order to support the, the wireless alerting system, but that's not enough. You have to have also the education, the community supporting. Um, the effort in Mexico is a great example where um, the country is learning that there's a certain sound, there's a certain tone that says earthquake. So that's the community. It's, it's the government, but then the community is supporting. And the last, without the industry providing the technology, nothing can happen. Um, we have partners also in Israel, that's my homeland, and thank you for mentioning that. There's a lot of similarities between what we see working with a partner in Israel and what we are trying to do here. Because at the end of the day, 
um, um, urgent or, or imminent threats are not just from underground, but as Israel um, um, uh, can uh, witness, it's also from above. And it's very, very similar. And uh, we could, first of all, see also the partnership between the government, the community, and the industry uh, coming together to address that. Um, one could not do that. Um, there are a lot of challenges even there with carriers that um, take time to support. Um, even iOS devices are, are not fully supporting what they need to support, but it's getting there. And again, this is a partnership between, in this case, an American industry that is working with the state, uh, with the government of Israel in order to support um, what is needed. Um, one interesting thing that, uh, that is related to that, and that's maybe the second takeaway, that um, early warning is not just Earthquake. I know that this is focusing on um, a, a seismological a threats, but um, in, the, in the previous panel discussion, um, we need to think about whole hazard. I remember when we started to work with the um, U.S. Air Force 10 years ago, one of the, the, um, the concepts that uh, really resonated with me was full spectrum hazard or threat response. And if you think about it, that was the way that the government, the DOD in this case, um, addressed threats. It's not that it's only one A singular particular threat, so it's not just fire, but could be also active shooter, could also be weather, could also be um, 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 earthquake. So looking at all hazards, so that was the full spectrum threat, but then also the full spectrum response, because there's no one way to respond. Um, and and Mark Lucero um, um, touched upon that, that um, okay, you can reach 30%, this is beautiful because you have a way to reach 30%, but there are other ways, other means. And you need to think about this challenge holistically. This is one of the things that we bring, uh, bring to, the, to the table, and I think that um, uh, we were one of the first uh, um, um, technologies to think about unification, that it's not just um, sirens, um, what they call giant voice or big voice, make a really loud noise, and it's not just um, in, uh, things that are indoor, like fire, um, and it's not only things that you have on you, like cell phones or, or, or computers, but it's actually the holistic approach. It's, it's again, it's the full spectrum response in this case. And, and this is what we need to address. So um, thinking about all them, but also unifying them, because in time of stress, in time of um, threat, you don't have time. Um, so we were speaking about automation. Automation is extremely important when we speak about just seconds. Uh, but at the same time, not going into one means, but, but covering the whole spectrum. The last point is very interesting, and again, it's, it's a little bit in a, in a tangent to what we're speaking here, and this is the public notification versus the agency notification. And actually, one of the, one of the lessons that I learned from our partners in Mexico was very interesting. They have a beautiful system to um, um, sensors to, um, to um, identify, to um, detect a seismological activity, and um, but then the automation and going to the system, to the radios, to um, the system that, that we had built, is only if there's a certain threshold, and keep me honest, I think it's six, um, or maybe five and something, but um, so if it's at a certain level, this is where you want to announce to the public. But what happens with lower levels? And interesting enough, this is where you also need to notify, but it's not the same audience. Because in that case, you want to notify first responders. You want to notify the authorities. There are other organizations that is very important for them to know about it. So we need to think in these cases not only about public mass notification, but also about notifying the responders, dot, those that um, should know about such threats. And working with the federal government, working with many other um, customers here in the US, what we had seen is that this interaction between agencies, between organization, is extremely important. Not always the messages will go only to the public, but you need to think about how to notify, how to work, how to communicate between those responders to let them know awareness, provide instructions, or receive responses um, about what they're doing. So these are the three pillars that, I, again, if I look back on, on our experience, partnership is a must-have, full spectrum, all hazard um, in terms of threat and response. And the third one is it's not just about the public, but there's a lot of inter-agency, inter-organization communication that you have to address. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shunta Noda. Uh, I'm a researcher of the Railway Technical Research Institute, Japan, and a visiting scientist of the USGS. Uh, so today I'd like to uh, introduce the current EW system for Shinkansen. Uh, as you may know, the Shinkansen is a Japanese high-speed uh, train. Uh, in other words, it's called the bullet train. Uh, okay. Have you ever used uh, JR line? Okay, good. Actually, <laughs> uh, my salary is uh, from the uh, rail fare of JR. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for using JR. <laughs> okay, uh, actually, uh, JR has good results that uh, nobody has ever been killed by the accident, uh, including caused by the natural disaster, uh, such as earthquake. So, fortunately. So the, okay, uh, I worked in the development and the uh, expansion of the EW system for Shinkansen. So the uh, okay, uh, Railway Technical Research Institute is my institute that uh, developed the first EW system uh, that is called the uh, Urgent Earthquake uh, Detection and Alarm System, uh, which is called UREDAS, uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, but after that, uh, my institute uh, replaced with uh, replaced Uredas with the current system for Shinkansen uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, actually, the current system doesn't have the abbreviated name uh, like Uredas. So the, uh, over the 200 seismic stations for the current system are uh, installed in Japan at present. Uh, the number is still increasing uh, due to the extensions of the uh, Shinkansen routes. Uh, and these stations are completely separated from the JMA and the NIED stations. Uh, so I mean the, uh, our station is basically uh, uh, for the railway. Uh, so the current system has two important roles. Uh, the first one is to stop the trains in case of earthquakes. Uh, second one is uh, to inform the Shinkansen operators uh, about the seismic intensity uh, in order to resume the uh, operation of Shinkansen. Uh, our current system has two types of seismometer. Uh, the first one is uh, mechanical seismograph. Uh, this seismograph is, uh, has high reliability uh, due to a simple inverted uh, pendulum structure uh, which detects the acceleration of the uh, high, uh, horizontal component. Uh, the second one is so-called uh, display seismometer, uh, which is uh, electronic one, uh, not mechanical. Uh, this seismometer can measure seismic intensity uh, and calculate earthquake parameters such as uh, epicenter location and magnitude and uh, connect with the central server of the current system by using the TCP IP protocol. Okay, uh, these seismometers are typically installed at the uh, power substation of Shinkansen or a uh, place where far from Shinkansen tracks uh, in order to detect earthquakes uh, which occur around there as soon as possible. Uh, okay, both, uh, both mechanical and display seismometers can issue the uh, stop signal for the trains uh, to the power substation uh, if the substation receives the stop signal, uh, that substation stops, uh, provides the power immediately. Uh, actually, Shinkansen uses the uh, emergency brake if the power is shut down. Uh, I mean, the, we utilize the uh, procedure to the st <coughs> stop the trains. So we have uh, two threshold whether uh, to stop the trains or not. Uh, the first one is simply the threshold of acceleration. Uh, for example, it's uh, 40 gal uh, for the seismometer which locates in the power substations. Uh, sec the second one is the M delta method. This is method is uh, also simple. Uh, this method defines the empirical relationship between magnitude and epicentral distance in terms of the damage to the railway structure, uh, such as via duct. Uh, by the first uh, earthquakes. I mean, we stop the trains running in the larger area uh, in case of the bigger earthquakes. Uh, okay, uh, recently, a few years ago, we started uh, using the uh, JMAEW alert uh, as additional information. Uh, 
the threshold for the, the M delta method. Uh, the reason why the JMAEW is additional information is that the uh, Japan railway companies have to protect Shinkansen from earthquakes by themselves, uh, even though the JMA system uh, doesn't work so well. Uh, they are uh, responsible for the safe operation of Shinkansen. Uh, that's why uh, we have the system which is separated from the JMA and a a NID systems. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple questions for the speakers before we open it up to everyone else. Um, so over the past two days, we've talked about political challenges, we've talked about scientific challenges and how we're going to overcome both of them. So um, now today is all about implementation challenges, um, such as time, that we've, you know, the time of the signal, the time that it takes to get the signal from one thing to another. So for our panelists, what challenges for implementation do you see and how are we in the process of overcoming those challenges? So we came across two unique challenges when we were developing our technology. Uh, one of them was really more of a concern, and that was obviously latency. The last thing we want to do is add time to delivering these alerts. So building, uh, building a cloud system from scratch was, was somewhat daunting, and, and we, were, we were worried about, well, you know, sending out push notifications to phones and um, delivering that in areas where the, the coverage isn't, you know, is, isn't so great. So, we, we built the system to the best of our ability to deliver these warnings, and we actually ran some tests side by side with both ShakeAlert and um, the mobile app. And we were, we were pleased to see that we had about less than a second latency added on to, to the alert time. So that was, that was a, 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 nice, a nice surprise. Uh, another kind of interesting problem we had, just a very simple problem, when we were integrating with uh, uh, firehouse doors, we wanted to do just do it over uh, RF. So we want to just open the doors, not go into hardwiring and, and, and making it more complex than it needed to be. But we came to the point where we realized, well, if you pull up to your home garage door and you hit the button, it just cycles it. So the garage door opens, closes. If the door's open, the garage door closes. So a, a very, very simple, simple problem, and we ended up having to come up with a, a workaround. So we were able to... Uh, do a hardwire into the open only directly on the mechanism on the, the firehouse door. So in the instance that the doors are already open and we have an earthquake uh, alert, it still sends out the open, the open signal, but the doors are open, so we're, we're fine. Now, the last thing we want to do is, 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 is have that happen to us uh, and close the doors in the emergency. So you know, we, we're, we're, we're coming up with, with small hurdles like that and realizing there are some limitations and um, but it's, it's all part of the process, and uh, we like to be able to share those back with uh, you know, the community and, um, and get, obviously, feedback from, from you as well, finding out about more, more things we can try to help you overcome. Uh, I actually have three. And, uh, Go for it. The first one uh, is organizational inertia. Things at rest tend to stay at rest, and if you try to pull a rowboat along the side of a dock, it's easy. If it's a yacht, it's going to take a lot longer and it's going to take a lot more patience and you just have to hang in there and keep plugging away at it. And uh, we finally got there, but uh, uh, for those of you that are thinking about this from your institutional standpoint, you end up having, having to go to uh, basically the leadership of the organization and uh, once you end up selling that idea, then it's going to be a lot easier. Second one is, uh, uh, and I have to thank Kate Long from State OES in our conversation today because we are in the process of uh, cranking up the PSAs, public service announcements that are going to go out, and she, have, and she brought up the issue of uh, the potential for mixed messages, and perhaps uh, we should uh, integrate and at least share ideas from the standpoint of making sure that uh, we find ourselves in a position where we don't give the expectation to the public that because uh, BART has received an early warning that they're going to step outside and the rest of the world around the community has it because they don't. And uh, anecdotally, um, I ended up bringing up the issue that uh, when they instituted the 911 system in Alameda County, 
there was a great reticence from uh, the County of Alameda Sheriff's Department that ends up running it for all of the unincorporated areas, that they didn't want to even institute it at all because they wouldn't be able to handle the call volume. And uh, uh, I was on the committee that, that uh, was doing that, uh, and I said, well, go ahead and implement it. Uh, and as soon as Alameda County doesn't basically have those resources, you're going to get hammered. And I got news for you. I'll be one of the guys hammering it. Uh, and the idea here is to get it done, you know, um, initiate, and then every system that you end up implementing is going to have difficulties. There's going to be unperceived uh, issues, and you can refer to it as consequence management, but uh, whenever you go ahead and launch something, uh, you're always going to have to stand back and wait to react to the things that need to be tweaked. That's it. You know, the only totally wrong action is no action, all right? Uh, lastly, the, the issue that uh, we are dealing with right now is that we end up getting a signal and um, uh, we're still fighting uh, the, the issue with CIS and, and BART and anybody else to try to refine that algorithm where we can end up uh, taking the information from the P wave and make it actionable and then reduce it down to an actionable time frame. And uh, we're still working on that collectively. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I can resonate with a lot of the things that were said here. And it's, an, it's, it's a beautiful question. And uh, when I'm thinking about it, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a technical guy, I'm a techie. But, um, and, and I'm looking back and I do realize that the major challenges that we had seen in implementation were not technical. Um, you know, we, ha we have tens of brilliant engineers, you know, Josh has, so it's like things can be done. That's, um, that's working. Working in a lab, it's, uh, it can be done. But then the question, when you bring it to the real world, what then? And um, time and again, what uh, we've seen is that um, the issue of ownership, of responsibility, to find that group that would take ownership, um, and that means everything between setting the tone, setting the objective, funding or finding the funding, um, and, and uh, being uh, willing to stand up and, and take the action. And I completely agree with you. That's, that, that is the, the, the major hurdle for implementations to, to find that. A follow-up for that is, is the CONOPS, is the, the concept of operation. And this is related to setting, okay, so what is happening or how things should be happening um, are we choosing a tone? What kind of tone is it? How can we educate the public that that tone is, is it? Um, who is allowed to push the button? Who is not? In what cases? Um, how do we deal with liabilities? So um, everything around the, the operations and deciding, and again, taking ownership and leading that, this is what we had found as, as the major hurdle. Technology, um, I'm not saying it's simple. Again, that's, that's my job to make things happen. Um, but at the end of the day, we have a lot of great examples out there. It's getting there. It takes time. Um, as Mark said, um, if you want to have another tone, it's going to take years because you need to go through regulation, you need to go through the cares, you need to get, go through a lot of things. But you know what? That, that can be done. It's not a technical issue. It's the process. It's the ownership. It's the responsibility. It's the taking the action. So uh, again, when, when you go back and think, okay, so what shall we do now? It's not deciding what technology, but deciding who to work with and how to um, shepherd that through whatever you need to go through. And, and this is what I'm, I'm sharing here. It's a lot of um, pointing fingers, um, shying from action, um, a lot of others. Okay, so t time means, uh, for example, our up time or leave time? Or yeah, just the, um, the time, the, s the alert goes out and mm -hmm. you have this great idea, this great system, but you want to make sure that, that whatever your idea is doesn't add a whole other layer of latency and, and time to okay. the actual delivery. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, for the, uh, especially for the Japanese railway, uh, has uh, mm, two aspects of about time. I mean, the... Uh, if earthquake happen, uh, how uh, rapid uh, we can stop the trains? So the I think that uh, about that we, we have two two method. Uh, the first one is a uh, update of the method. For example, the 
uh, actually I'm now in the USGS, that's why the, uh, I'd like to study the uh, relationship between the initial P wave and the final magnitude. Uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, the in Tohoku earthquake, the initial P wave, amplitude of the initial P wave was very small. And uh, in addition, the Tokachi Oki earthquake that happened the 2003, uh, its magnitude 8.0 was also small amplitude uh, for initial P wave. So that if the uh, such phenomena is uh, happen in case of the future large earthquake, uh, the uh, earthquake, uh, so the train can be stopped uh, more earlier, more faster. So the uh, the first aspect of for the railway uh, about time is that how uh, fast uh, we can resume to operate after the after the earthquake. So uh, it's a very uh, important uh, important issue for for us. I mean, the, uh, actually, we have the uh, method method procedure to resume the operation of the trains, but it's difficult to change the uh, procedure. I mean, the, that procedure uh, it seems that that, that procedure the works well, but the, uh, so the it's we are afraid to the change the threshold or the procedure. So the, uh, uh, so the, it's not an easy <laughs> question. So the, um, if we'd like to resume the uh, trains uh, as soon as possible, the number of stations is increased, uh, may be needed. So it's a direct uh, answer. Or the, or, mm, or mm, I have an idea, the, for example, the information, the, for example, the NYED station uh, uh, or the JMS station uh, can be used. I don't know, but uh, mm, it's uh, my idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So in the interest of time, we will skip my second question and save that in case there are you know, crickets chirping in about five minutes. But um, I kind of wanted to open it up to the audience. I know that uh, Joe had flagged me. Joe Di Pasquale, are you here? I know you had flagged me to ask a question earlier. Um, and if there's any others that want to, uh, to, well, I guess we'll have a frame go first, and then we'll pass it on to Joe. OK, my question to the industry forum really is in a, in a different manner about implementation, we know that the system work and it will work better and so on, it will be alive in certain time. Uh, we are all here in this auditorium and we feel safe, at least against fire, you can see the fire switch there, you can see the sprinklers. Uh, we don't know what happens here in an earthquake. I mean, most likely the building is secure, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, how do we get warned here? What is the responsibility of the owner of the building to alert us? Because I know in Mexico City itself, they issued an ordinance that every business above certain visitors needs to have a warning device. We don't want to have very many warning devices against all, but uh, I can tell you personally that I went for a breakfast three weeks ago to a restaurant and in the entrance door, they have a sign, we are protected here, you will hear the seismic alert when there is an, uh, an incident, you can eat safely. So I was very happy. <laughs> I was very happy I even ordered coffee after the meal. But the question is, what should, or <laughs> should we go in this approach? Should the seismic warning uh, delivery uh, be kind of, uh, established in the standard similar to the fire uh, alarm and uh, to what degree the government need to regulate such things. Um, thank you, Ephraim. It's a great, great, great question. And um, one of my other hats, I'm also a member of the National Fire Protection Association. I'm actually in the board of the Technical Committee for um, Emergency Communication Systems. And uh, one of our charters is to look at um, NFPA regulation, um, certainly NFPA 72, which is really regulating <coughs> that you see here. 
um, um, all hazard. Um, seismic is certainly one of them. The challenge here is that you know you can you can set regulation needs to be something that is is possible as well. Um, uh, you know uh, you can you can set a regulation that every restaurant, every public place will have such seismic alarm, but you don't have the foundation, you don't have the framework to support the sensor it's not very helpful. Even if the sensor is local, um, you guys are much smarter than, than, than I am on the seismic alerting, but you know that this is less um, effective than uh, something that is more distributed in, uh, in manner and then can provide a, more, um, a longer time to, to response. So the, the answer is certainly regulation, I mean, and this is what I refer to as the partnership, but the regulation needs to look not just, okay, you need to put um, such a, a warning uh, in place, but the regulation should be, okay, there's uh, uh, a way to get the, the, the signal, there's a way to connect to the signal, and then this is what we are um, demanding or, or requiring um, public uh, uh, venues to have. So the, the answer is, is regulation, I, I have no doubt. And um, as, as I said, it's the community, the industry, and the government. You know, and, and to add to that, I think there's sort of a two-tier approach to that. Um, you know, one of the benefits of this public-private partnership is being able to collaborate and sort of set those standards. And I think there's two ways to educate the public on how to respond, and one of those would be through you know, PSAs, education to the individuals, you know, duck, cover, and hold. And at the same time, also, you know, having having a sign on the door, just like an evacuation sign or how to use a fire extinguisher, say, you know, this building is equipped with an earthquake early warning system, and if you hear the tone, duck, cover, and hold. You know, it's, and, uh, and that's another thing that we, that we do on our app is we have a blurb of advice. It tells them what to do. So if they're, out, you know, if they're inside, duck, cover, hold. If they're outside, it tells them what to do. If they're in a moving vehicle, it tells them what to do. So um, you know, it's a two-tiered two approach. It's to set the standard, make sure the public and uh, businesses are are educated on, on how, how to respond, uh, and also, you know, visual type things. And also the alert, you know, you can have, have in the alert, you know, earthquake, 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 duck cover and hold. You can have a customized, um, you know, audible directions in a, a place that has, you know, large amounts of people. So, yeah. Uh, I think that as soon as we ended up hearing the, the government question, uh, all the emergency managers in the room already knew the answer to that because uh, under the National Incident Management System, uh, all agencies or public agencies are required to participate in the incident command system. And uh, uh, that includes the mitigation and pre-planning for this. And so the, the participation by Office of Emergency Services for the state of California in here is a key component to that. Joe? So yeah, my name is Joe DePasquale. I'm CEO of a company called Regroup, and Richard Allen asked me to speak just for a minute about our work with the Shake Alerts team. Um, Regroup's an emergency messaging company. We've been doing emergency messaging for 10 years, and so a few years ago, we started working with San Francisco, the city of San Francisco, on uh, kind of business continuity solutions, texting employees when systems go down, and also mass messaging um, you know, 301 sends mass messages to us to their hundreds of thousands of citizens when needed. But um, Mayor Ed Lee mentioned us on Wednesday because we've started this year an initiative with the mayor's office that's completed a fully functioning prototype of text and voice blasts when Shake Alerts gives a signal to us that would initially text the 30,000 employees that they have who are all first responders and then eventually looking in the future to the residents of San Francisco. Um, a couple things that I'm hearing from the panel is different. It's, it's not an application, so there are some technical hurdles that we've had to work through in the past year of, um, you know, applications obviously only go out to people with smartphones, but for text messaging, you have to look at how do you text message hundreds of thousands of people in seconds, or even 30,000 people in seconds, definitely not, you know, not a trivial problem. Um, or looking at how do you get information out of a shake alert system, which is currently a desktop system, but a huge thank you to Jen for going above and beyond and working with us. Um, Doug Newhauser above and beyond working with us, and Richard as well, because I think they recognize this is something that hasn't come up yet, but even for private industry, uh, you know, when the shake alert system becomes production ready, it takes private industry still some time 
to actually build on top of that system. So they've done a great job in letting us work in parallel so that when the system is production ready, we can look at you know, being ready at that same time. And even now, in talking to you guys, you know, doing some, some testing of messaging employees so that they know as first responders and that sort of thing, so that there's something that you know, the mayor, Ed Lee, can go back to his residents and employees and say, you know, we have this win here. It would be the, one of the first, and actually at San Francisco leading the way for the first national mass messaging system based on early earthquake warnings. So for me, I'm very excited about the conference because this is the first time I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people here. And I just wanna also make myself available because we've been working for, you know, what, nine months now on shake alerts and, and kind of integrating with that system. So I wanna offer myself as a resource to anyone who maybe is also working with that system so we can give you our lessons learned. Um, and I'm joe at regroup.com, but I'm happy to talk more about it. So thanks, John. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Tom, Bur burning questions? This is a, a burning question for notice on. And uh, this, so um, JNR, uh, used now JR, uh, operated Uridus for years and designed this system for the bullet train and was very successful with operating the system and developing it for the train, but it was, it was not available to other Japanese or other applications. It was designed for the train. And now there's a new system, <clears throat> the JMA system, which is designed for everyone to be a much more general system but JR still runs the train, and ha you have your own parts of the system. And how do you integrate between JMA system and the JR system? And what do you see the future for that? Uh, is there some collaboration? Okay. Uh, <laughs> in my opinion, the uh, it's not easy to share the data uh, between the uh, JR and JMA that because uh, 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 JR company is afraid to be blamed by the public. Uh, for example, if the everybody gets data, uh, uh, they may say that, oh, why uh, this is so dangerous or uh, uh, yeah, the, we, we may be blamed. So that uh, it's not easy for us to share, open the data. So that, uh, yeah, we know that uh, the to open the data is a mm, good way, but the, uh, mm, I think not so easy. Mm, easy. Well, what about using the JMA data? How much yes. does JR use the JMA data? How much? You mean cost? You mean you mean cost? Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. So so does does JR make use of the JMA data? JR doesn't send out its data, but does JR ingest the JMA data? Mm -hmm. So so you mean the uh, possibility? No, oh, sorry. Do they sorry. now? Cur yeah, currently do they do you, does JR use the JMA uh -huh. yeah. alert data? Yeah yeah. Yeah, we, so sorry, uh, we, we, we use the uh, JMA data, uh, so the JMA alerts, uh, but the we don't send the, our data to the JMA. And the JMA data is mm -hmm. very important to JR, or, or is it not so important? Uh, as I said, uh, it's uh, additional information for the politics, but the sometimes the uh, alert is faster than the, our system, to be honest. So the, it's important, yeah. So, um, well, uh, my question is for, uh, for Josh and for Aviv. Can you uh, introduce yourself? Sorry, I'm Gilad Werman. I'm with uh, Seismic Warning Systems. Um, and since I've made that introduction, I should point out that we spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, about the liability issue that Aviv mentioned, uh, and to some degree that uh, Nodasan mentioned, um, that uh, we view it as a maybe not 100%, but it's certainly a strong likelihood that come an earthquake, when there's an earthquake warning, somebody's gonna get sued. And so the question is, um, what sort of, you, you're proposing to uh, 
control systems, alert people who are potentially untrained, like at a restaurant setting. Um, what level of, let's say, false positives would you find to be acceptable from a liability perspective? And given that the signal that you get is coming out of ShakeAlert, what happens if ShakeAlert glitches and sends a false signal, and you guys then get ha have to shoulder the liability for people who take action as a result of that, and how do you plan to deal with that? You know, and again, that it's a possibility with really any system. Um, and setting those standards and testing and testing reliability, uh, it's just key to helping reduce that liability. Uh, as with anything, I mean, even with a, a, a fire system, uh, a smoke detector going off, setting off sprinklers, you know, it, it happens all the time. Uh, and people get sued. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a, a challenge that we're going to have to address. And it's not something that we've, uh, we've ignored. Uh, but, you know, working hard, setting the standards, making sure the system is as reliable as possible, uh, you know, that's, that's the best way we can approach that. And then also discussing those possible liabilities with end users. So, you know, playing a notice in a, a, a large crowded amphitheater, you know, may, may not be the right answer. And it's helping define that and figure out what that standard is uh, that will really help ease a lot of that liability, uh, being able to say, well, you know, this is the standard, alerts went out based off of the standard, you know, and that's, and that's the facts of the case. So um, I think hopefully that addresses your question. Um, it, it is a great question, and um, a, f a, few, a few angles to look at that. Um, first of all, certainly in this country, um, lawsuits are, are given. Um, I, I don't think we can avoid that. Um, I, I do believe, I do truly believe, as, as John said, that that does not meet, mean that you go into no action. Um, so that's something that I think that our um, our leaders should uh, should really ingrain. So the fact that you um, you do something and can be sued doesn't mean that you you are not going to do that. Um, and um, and so uh, that's that's the first level. The second level is really thinking about outreach here. And and, and actually, if you look just about the last few weeks, uh, what happened in Israel? In Israel, there is a very very good uh, uh, system for detection of uh, of rockets and missiles. And then at some point. There were some changes, and, and um, some were not detected, which means the sirens didn't work. Again, I'm not speaking about Iron Dawn, I'm just speaking about the sirens, meaning the warning. Um, and there was an uproar, like people said, how come sirens didn't work? We're used to have sirens, and know that when there's a siren, we take shelter. Um, and and um, this, is, this is part of, of the education here, that no system is 100% proof, Second, um, in both cases, positive and negative. So um, uh, positive alarms or, or negative alarms. So um, in that case, it, it must be part of, of outreach and um, uh, things may happen. That doesn't mean that if you, um, that you rely just on that, um, that there are multiple ways to, um, uh, to, to rely. You know, it's, it's a, just as a, as a great example, um, I remember one of our customers that um, um, they, in, in a drill, what they've, se what they've seen is that um, people, some people were receiving the signal and they're running out and other people did not receive a signal and they were waiting in place until they received the signal. Wrong behavior. <laughs> like if you see people running, you should join them because something <laughs> is happening. So it's, it's, this, is, this is part of edu edu educating the, the public. Um, and again, things will go wrong. That's given. The, the question here is, how many lives have you saved? And this is where we call for action. We call for taking responsibility. We call for taking ownership. It's not a simple question. And again, everyone that is thinking about his um, seat or, or you know, future election, um, it's even more challenging. But again, I, I think that at the end of the day, people will remember what you've done and not what you haven't done. Thank you. Sort of a good example of a way that, that, that's been successful is I'm, I'm a first responder. Uh, I taught CERT at Burbank Fire and helped run that program for seven years. And as first responders, uh, we're actually protected under the Good Samaritan Law. So when we go to a scene, you know, we're, we're there, we're there to help. We provide just basic first aid. 
um, and yeah. triage, and we're protected. There's laws that were established to protect those first responders. So, you know, that, that might be a good way to approach it and look at, well, you know, if, if, if companies and businesses and organizations are going to start doing these alerts, you know, there, there may be an answer there with legislation that can help protect uh, those companies along with, with setting those standards. As Gavin Newsom ended up pointing out uh, on Wednesday, that uh, if the government was the airline industry and they had the ability to implement something and did not, would they be held accountable if there were consequences because they did not? And the potential there is a heck of a lot higher than it would be if you ended up having a false alarm or something like that. Uh, speaking just to, to do a little bit of um, uh, covering for the BART system, uh, when we initiate a signal to immediately slow down the trains when we end up getting a, a threshold um, uh, activation, it's automatic. But the initial deceleration rate on the trains is going to be the same deceleration rate that goes into BART stations. And so we're not going to uh, injure anyone extraordinarily in association with a false alarm. Uh, whether the, the big threshold in the early warning system that we end up implementing, uh, and this is my own personal opinion, uh, and so I'm not speaking for BART or for CISN or Cal or anybody else. I'm personally not that concerned about uh, false positives. I'm going to end up uh, being really short-tempered when it comes to false negatives. Uh, if we're supposed to have that alert, we really need to get that alert. And the expectation of the public is going to end up being that we end up providing that. As we end up going for, farther for, for, further forward, <laughs> that way, <laughs> as we end up uh, going uphill with this, don't forget that the state of the art as, and the expectation of the public that, that will end up uh, expecting this service to be there uh, if we look at it from strictly a managerial standpoint, if we have held back uh, as a stakeholder, whether it be in the rail industry or uh, any other industry, don't forget that if the expectation is there and we ended up having the ability to implement and to keep track with uh, uh, everyone else and the rest of the community from the standpoint of implementing early warning systems uh, throughout the, the entire state, uh, as individual stakeholders, then as using the model again from Gavin Newsom, uh, I would much rather be in the position of defending myself for a po false positive than for not having implemented anything again at, at all. Uh, back again to the only totally wrong decision or action is no action. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for like comments. I don't know if we have time for a whole bunch of more questions, but. Uh. So I'll turn my question into an appeal, which we can follow <laughs> up on later. It's a, it was a very nuts and bolts question slash appeal. As I think everybody in the panel is aware, many people in the room are aware, we continually get asked, those of us working towards a public early warning system, are continually asked for cost-benefit demonstration of the value of the system. We've heard a lot, but I'm struck, um, you know, particularly with ATOC and early warning labs, and there are other similar groups, Regroup, for example, um, other groups in the audience. When we're trying to identify exactly what are the cost benefits, I think we could really use help from you. You've been out there talking to possible users to identify what those uses possibly are that we're not aware of and actually try and quantify them. I think that will actually really help us. So I'll make an appeal. We don't need to talk about it now. But please um, do come to us. We'll come to you <laughs> and help us with that. Um, so I realize that none of you, so you can say no, we don't know the answer, if, um, are with utilities, but I know that the idea of, well, the gas should shut off or the electricity should do something, you know, what is it that they're supposed to do? What would you want to see if you know the answer? Anyone? All right. What is it? Okay. Uh, I'm not, uh, I can end up speaking for BART, uh, and we've already done it. The, uh, uh, as far as PG&E and 
the other utilities, uh, they have their own plans, and I can't speak to those. As, uh, okay. As an industry, I was curious. As, as an industry, I think it's our responsibility to do everything that we possibly can to be in this room, find out what the, uh, the state of the art is from the science standpoint, and then figure out how, let's face it, uh, show of hands again with all the scientists that we have here. All right. Show of hands of all the first responders. All right. The first responders find themselves in a position where they're looking for solutions, they're looking for information so that we can come up with ideas of how we're going to implement it uh, and how we're going to be able to use those tools. When it comes from, and I have a great deal of respect and personal friends who are the scientists in this room, uh, but uh, there's a partnership that has to take place between them and me from a transportation standpoint or from a first responder standpoint where uh, the first responders are going to have to figure out exactly how uh, it's going to best operate for them. The most significant thing during the 1989 uh, earthquake uh, was that, and at that time I was a battalion chief in the Oakland Fire Department, uh, was that uh, several of our apparatus doors didn't open up because uh, the apparatus doors were, were uh, uh, knocked off uh, the rails. And as a result, when all of those public safety personnel are supposed to be responding out to try to take care of uh, all the disasters that are going on, we literally had to take aerial ladder trucks with chainsaws and go to other fire stations and cut the apparatus doors off so that those engines could get out. And it's those kinds of ideas and th that kind of information where we have to have that partnership where we can end up, uh, and it's a segue from one to the other, and the, it's almost like a, uh, like a relay race. The, the industries, public utilities, and public safety are standing there on the starting blocks uh, waiting for that baton to be passed to them. And it's up to them to go ahead and take it from there. Did I answer that right? So uh, can I just comment on this utility uh, issue? So it's because some of our test users are utilities, and they operate very complex engineered systems. And uh, just like the railway, they're, they're kind of concerned about changing some system with unintended consequences. If a, if a change is made in the system, it has to be carefully thought through and engineered so that it actually works. So when we come to them with something new like this, they have to think carefully about what they're going to do with it. But in the meantime, for instance, Edison told us they're quite concerned about the safety of their workers in an earthquake, that, that they're around high voltage equipment, and that this kind of information for situational awareness could actually be valuable for life safety for their workers, and, and they view that as, as valuable. Okay, I think we can do Herbert. We're, we're already a little bit over, and then. Uh... So, so for the two railroad systems, um, unlike walking into a building where I have the option to leave at any time, my assumption is once I'm on the train and the doors close, I'm under the care, custody, and control of the railway itself. Now, you've talked about how early warning will help you slow down, shut the train system down. Do you have specific messaging that will go out to the passengers on the trains that will basically let them know that, okay, we've had an event of some type, and this is what we need you to do? We're working on that right now, and I plan on having my PI uh, staff uh, working with Kate Long in order to make sure that uh, we do the best possible job that we can. This is, uh, don't forget that uh, we have two sets of messaging, one for if you're in the station, the other one if you're on the train. Now, for the emergency stopping of trains, uh, we already have canned messages for that. The only thing that we have to do is just go ahead and plug in that one word, earthquake, we're gonna be here for a while, and then what the procedures are. Whenever there's an earthquake, whether we have an early warning or not, we already have that procedure in place and the announcements will end up going out to the public at that time. But we need to end up ramping that up considerably. Uh, okay. Mm, uh, uh, I think that in Shinkansen, uh, if we ask a couple, uh, 
uh, there is display. So the display says uh, emergency break. So the catch something uh, and take cover yourself. Uh, I think that's all. But after that, uh, the display says uh, ask it happened. Uh, for example, the seismic intensity was uh, something. So the mm, uh, I think the uh, needed information uh, is all. So I, I mean the. Uh, uh, not needed information uh, cannot be told to the uh, customers in Shinkansen. Okay. Okay, last okay. one. Okay. In terms of trains, um, how much of a difference would 10 seconds make? Would it have made a difference in 1989? And if you had an even bigger earthquake today, uh, how much of a benefit would an early warning system be that saved you? If got got the information to you 10 seconds faster than you would get it otherwise. Well, I've uh, already given that example in my introductory remarks. Um, uh, for BART as the industry or the transportation industry, it just looking at it from the life safety and uh, reduction threshold of potential injuries that will be caused by derailments. And even if a derailment uh, occurs, think about the difference of having a derailment at 40 miles an hour rather than 70 miles an hour. And the deceleration injuries that uh, would end up occurring and the magnitude of resources that it would take to try to take care of those folks. Uh, that's uh, astronomical uh, back to the point of when the public safety is not available because they're, they're um, up to their eyeballs and other emergencies that they're trying to take, a, take care of. If you can think about the, uh, and I'm thinking about the bridge collapse that they had in Wisconsin about uh, 2007. Uh, 13 people ended up losing their lives and there were about five cars, uh, correction, there were about 15 cars that uh, were under the water and it literally took them uh, and the casualties they were able to identify in a number of hours, yet that particular event uh, held up and tied up the entire state's resources just for that one bridge, for that few number of uh, casualties associated with that for literally months, all right? The magnitude in a major earthquake where we would have uh, something, and I really don't want to get my brain around having something larger than the Cypress collapse because that was just astronomical and exhausting. So uh, 10 seconds is going to end up making a real big difference from the standpoint of survivability of uh, the infrastructure, at least as we have it planned in BART. And I think that's gonna end up being crucial for, uh, if assuming that, that we are able to be successful and we have at least 10 seconds worth of uh, warning for us to, to uh, be able to help out and, and buffer the uh, collapse of the entire infrastructure and the ability to be able to uh, evacuate personnel out as well as uh, bring resources in so that the kind of events that occurred at the Superdome will never happen here. That's my goal. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna call Richard up to give a final, final word. Very quickly, a final word. I'll ask you guys to just hang out there for one moment. So uh, this brings us to an end. Actually, first of all, let's thank our, our second panel. Um, so that brings our, our meeting to a close. So I want to thank you all again for being here and making it such an interesting discussion over the last few days. I just want to acknowledge the co-organizers again, uh, John Vidali, uh, Doug Given, uh, Tom Heaton, Jenny Biggs, who's not from the Moore Foundation, who's not here right now, and of course, Jen. Um, I want to thank the people who've been doing all of the running around. Um, I want to thank Margaret Vinci, who was here a moment ago, oh, right here, um, and also Clay Miller uh, and Jennifer Taggart, who have been helping out here. And finally, and in particular, I want to thank Jen Strauss, who, of course, has been doing all of the legwork for this entire meeting. So let's just thank Jen. <laughs>